One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called Zealot, the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The great uh, evangelist and preacher, revivalist, John Wesley, once said this rather astonishing thing about prayer. He said this, It seems that God is limited by our prayer life, that he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. And that's quite a statement to make because he's saying that God is in some way, or has chosen to be, dependent on our prayers. Uh, so much so that if he's to do any work among us, says Wesley, then we must pray. It just doesn't happen automatically. We have to ask God. Uh, but if we look at the Gospel reading this morning, we can see actually that this, it bears out what uh, Wesley said. Uh, Luke begins with this simple observation in verse 12. He says about Jesus, he says, In these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer. Now, how important that time of prayer is, is borne out as we follow through the passage you just read. Uh, for example, look what happens immediately afterwards. We're told that when it was day, Jesus called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. In other words, Luke wants us to see that what Jesus does next is a consequence of what he did during the night. It had an effect, if in other words, on who exactly he chose to be his apostles. And these are very important to us, these twelve, because they are the pillars upon which he would build his church. It's built on the apostles and the prophets, we're told. And they were carefully chosen, not on the basis of what the eye sees or what the ear hears, but on what God discerns deep within them. And to find out what God discerns deep within them, Jesus had to pray. And this is borne out by the twelve, because if you look at the twelve of them, you have to honestly say that the, you know, we wouldn't have chosen them. We would not have chosen these twelve apostles. Peter was impetuous, headstrong. He always spoke before he thought. And he made promises he didn't always keep. James and John were known as the Sons of Thunder because although they were brothers, they were always bickering and quarrelling. They were always angry at each other. Matthew was or had been a tax collector. And although he was reformed, yet, you know, people didn't like tax collectors. And that goes a long way. Simon was a zealot and a terrorist. And, uh, of course, Judas would eventually betray him. And that's just a little flavour of the kind of bunch that... Jesus called together. So they don't look like they're going to get on, do they, really? And certainly they don't seem to be the number one choice of any of us in our saner moments. 
And yet these are the ones that Jesus chose. And such was his choosing that even the one we would call mistake, and that is Judas, was actually an integral part of God's plan of salvation. Without Jesus to betray him, then Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross. If he hadn't gone to the cross, he would have died for the sins of the world. We would not know the forgiveness of sins, the overcoming of evil, and so on. So you can see, even Judas was not a mistake. He was part of God's plan. And what is the reason for this discernment and this choosing? All night, he continued in prayer to God. And as we look further, what else do we see? We see great crowds coming to Jesus, not just to hear his inspired teaching, but also to be healed and to be um, delivered from evil spirits. And his success was not based upon what his human nature could produce, because none of us can cast out demons of ourselves or heal diseases of ourselves. It depended on the power and the grace of God that God gave him. And the source of that grace and that power? All night, he continued in prayer to God. And after all this, Jesus sits down with his disciples and gives us some of the sublime, the most beautiful teaching the world has ever heard in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. And what's behind this incredible teaching? Where does this come from, this teaching that even people who are not Christians will say they've never heard anything like it? Verse 12, all night he continued in prayer to God. Now as no one is saying that if we pray we will ever reach the same heights of wisdom or inspiration or power. We're not Jesus. That's not the point actually what is being made here. The point is this. What Wesley and others have taught over the years, and that is if we want to see God at work in the world and in our community and in our church and in our lives, then we need the roots of our very being, all that we are, to be planted deep in divine soil. And that means that we are to do this through prayer. What did Wesley say? It seems, he says, that God is limited by our prayer life, that he could do nothing for humanity unless somebody asks him. And it is the task of the church to do the asking. It's the task of the Christian to do the asking. It's our task to be engaged with God in his work. He will not do it without us. He could do, but he has chosen not to. In fact, he waits on us to pray. And if we truly love God, if we truly love those around us, if we truly love our church, and we, we don't want it to disappear and die, then we must do what Jesus did. We must pray. For all night, he continued in prayer to God.